Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we come to Joshua chapter 22, and this is our second to last study in the book of Joshua. We're going to skip chapters 20 and 21 <clears throat> because they record the distribution of the Holy Land among the tribes of Israel, and basically they are lists. And so we're just going to go to chapter 22, verse 1, and we'll ask, Lord God, that you would please add your blessing to the word that we're about to study. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 22, verse 1. Then Joshua summoned the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And remember, these two and a half tribes are the ones who received their portion of land outside the mainland of Israel, east of the Jordan River. And it says in verse 2, Joshua said to them, those three tribes, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I have commanded you. Joshua calls for a meeting, and in this meeting he encourages and commends the two and a half tribes for the good that they did. And it is important to commend God's people when they do something right. God believes in encouragement. Verse 3 You have not forsaken your brethren these many days down to this day, but have been careful to keep the charge of the Lord your God. They did not abandon their fellow Israelites. They had been faithful they crossed the Jordan River along with the other Israelites and they helped they helped conquer the mainland before they settled in their own portion east of the Jordan River so they were faithful to their brothers and they had been faithful even though it had not been easy and believe me it was not easy for the men in these two and a half tribes because they were away from their homes and their families for seven years. That's how long it took. Verse 4 And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brethren as he promised them. Therefore turn and go to your home in the land where your possession lies, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you on the other side of the Jordan. He says, God has kept his promise to your brothers. God keeps his promises. God is the only true promise keeper. The rest of us? Well, like it or not, the truth is, we are all promise breakers. We all fall in that category. Because if we have ever failed even with malicious intent or not, doesn't matter. If we have ever failed, even once, to do what we said we would do, then we fall into the category of promise breaker. That's why making an unconditional promise is forbidden by God. It is sinful pride that causes someone to do that. We are living in a world that we cannot control. Therefore, we should not make unconditional promises as if we are in control of everything. Oh yes, definitely I will do this. Definitely I will do that. You don't know that. Only God can say something like that. 5. Take good care to observe the commandment and the law which Moses the servant of the Lord commanded you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments 
and to cleave to Him and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul. Notice Joshua's final message to these two and a half tribes before they leave. It was not, well, go home and work hard. It was not, go home and make sure you get enough sleep and make sure you brush your teeth after every meal. It wasn't anything like that. His final message was, put God first. If they put God first, everything else falls into place. Verse 6, So Joshua blessed them, and sent them away, and they went to their homes. Now to the one half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given a possession in Bashan. But to the other half, Joshua had given a possession besides their brethren, or beside their brethren, in the land west of the Jordan. And when Joshua sent them away to their homes and blessed them, he said to them, now let's just stop there for a second. They got permission to live on the east side of the Jordan River, but it wasn't God's best for them. They were a long way from the central place of worship in Jerusalem. Whenever time they wanted to go to a religious feast, or they had to go to a religious feast, they had to cross the Jordan River. No, it wasn't convenient at all. And because they were outside the borders of the Holy Land, they were more susceptible to enemy attack, and they were attacked more often than the rest of Israel. They also were easily influenced by unsaved Gentiles because they were out in that area and it had an effect on them. So it really wasn't God's best for them, but he did allow them to have it. Verse 10 <clears throat> it says, And when they came to the region about the Jordan, when they came to the region about the Jordan, that lies in the land of Canaan the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan an altar of great size now before these three tribes cross the Jordan River and head home they stop and they build they build a replica of the holy altar which God directed Moses to build at the tabernacle verse 11 and the people of Israel heard say behold the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh have built an altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region about the Jordan on the side that belongs to the people of Israel and the law of God was crystal clear on this one do not have any other altar like the one for worship in the holy sanctuary that altar in the sanctuary was to be the altar used for official worship and so when the other nine tribes hear that these two and a half tribes are building this altar this replica they're all shook up about it verse 12 and when the people of Israel heard of it the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war against them and so these nine tribes they are very zealous for God they plan civil war if need be to stop what they think is sin. 13. Then the people of Israel sent to the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the priest. Israel put Phinehas in charge of this operation of confronting the three tribes about the altar. Remember Phinehas? 
He's the one who shoved the spear through that Israelite man and that pagan woman while they were sinning. That man means business. Phineas, he's the perfect man for this job. No doubt. 14. And with him, ten chiefs, one from each of the tribal families of Israel. Every one of them, the head of a family among the clans of Israel. <coughs> and so that the two and a half tribes would know that Phineas wasn't simply acting on his own. One man from every tribe went along with him. This was to show unity among the nine tribes. Verse 15 And they came to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead. And they said to them, and most likely Phineas was the spokesman, he said to them, Thus, verse 16, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, What is this teaching which you have committed? Or excuse me, what is this treachery which you have committed against the God of Israel in turning away this day from following the Lord by building yourselves an altar this day in rebellion against the Lord? <clears throat> in other words, the whole country wants to know why you are turning your back on God and committing this blatant sin. 17. Have we not had enough of the sin at Peor from which even yet we are not cleansed, we have not cleansed ourselves and for which there came a plague upon the congregation of the Lord? And the sin of Peor refers to the Israelite men and the Moabite women who sinned at the suggestion of Balaam. Remember that? <clears throat> God sent a plague as punishment. And of course Phineas knows all about that because the spear he shoved through those two sinners put an end to that plague. He says, we're still living with the consequences of that sin. So why are you doing this now? 18. Actually the last part of verse 17. It says, for which, for which there came a plague upon the congregation of the Lord, that you must turn away from this day from following the Lord. And if you rebel against the Lord today, he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel tomorrow. Phineas and company think they are confronting sin among their people. And I suppose that is a good thing. I mean, it shows a great zeal for God but the fact is they were way off base they really were because using another altar definitely would be sin but to be precise and you must be precise when you're dealing with the word of God just building another altar isn't wrong so because it didn't look right they blasted their brothers and accused them of sin that's wrong. If you're going to blast someone, well, you better make sure. You better make sure that you have the facts straight. God says, "Do not judge according to appearance, but make a righteous judgment." Nineteen. But now, if your land is unclean, pass over into the Lord's land, where the Lord's tabernacle stands, and take for yourselves a possession among us. Only do not rebel against the Lord or make us as rebels by building yourselves an altar other than the altar of the Lord our God. And this is very gracious. The nine tribes are saying, Now listen, if living so far away from the holy taber tabernacle will not work out for you, and that's why you have to build this altar which is closer to you, if that's why you're doing that, then just live here west of the Jordan with the rest of us. We'll give you some of our land. We'll share our land with you. And that's the gracious part. They were willing to sacrifice some of their land for the spiritual benefit of their brothers to help keep them from sinning. And there's a lesson for us there. It's not enough to just confront Christians for doing wrong. If these Christians, if they are sincere about changing 
then it is our responsibility to roll up our sleeves and help them do what we can 20 they say did not Achan the son of Zerah break faith in the matter of the devoted things and wrath fell upon all the congregation of Israel and he did not perish, perish alone for his iniquity see the nine tribes they are afraid of the ripple effect of any sin the three tribes would commit <coughs> 21 then the Reubenites the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh said in answer to the heads of the families of Israel the mighty one God the Lord the mighty one God the Lord he knows and let Israel itself know if it was in rebellion or in breach of faith toward the Lord spare us not today for building an altar to turn away from following the Lord the three tribes are shocked over being accused they appeal to God to confirm their innocence well you don't appeal to God back in those days about your innocence unless you have a clear conscience they had a clear conscience they were being falsely accused but at least they knew that they were right with God it's no fun to be falsely accused but a clear conscience before God will help you get through it at least you know you're right with God 23 no matter what anybody else says last part of verse 22 if it was in rebellion or in breach of faith toward the Lord spare us not today for building an altar to turn away from following the Lord or if we did it did so to offer burnt offerings or cereal offerings or peace offerings on it may the Lord himself take vengeance in other words God will decide if we've done wrong and they know he will too because we are all accountable to God God will judge those who falsely accuse God will also judge those who think they got away with their sin because no one caught them or no one even accused them 24 nay but we did it from fear that in time to come your children might say to our children what have you to do with the Lord the God of Israel in other words they did not build that altar because they didn't care about God they built it because they did care about God and so they were totally misunderstood this whole thing was a huge misunderstanding let's read 24 again and 25 nay but we did it from fear that in time to come your children might say to our children what have you to do with the Lord the God of Israel for the Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you you Reubenites and Gadites you have no portion in the Lord so your children might make our children cease to worship the Lord and so they were afraid that future generations of Israelites in the mainland would say you people east of the Jordan River you're not God's people they may say God sovereignly put a river between us and you to show that he doesn't want you and so we are afraid that your people may stop us from coming to the sanctuary to worship the Lord at some point in the future 26 therefore we said let us now build an altar not for burnt offerings not for sacrifice but to be a witness between us and you and between the generations after us that we do perform the service of the Lord in his presence with our burnt offerings and sacrifices and peace offerings lest your children say to our children in time to come you have no portion in the Lord and so this replica wasn't for worship it was a symbol a sign that they also were God's people and had every right to worship the Lord at his holy place 28 and we thought if this should be said to us or to our descendants in time to come we should say behold the copy of the altar of the Lord which our fathers made not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifice but to be a witness between us and you in other words in time to come if anyone gives us a hard time about worshiping God we will say see this altar we built as a witness 
it connects us to you. 29. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn away this day from following the Lord by building an altar for burnt offerings or grain offerings or sacrifice other than the altar of the Lord our God that stands before his tabernacle. In verse 30, when, the, when Phinehas the priest and the chiefs of the congregation of the heads of the families of Israel who were with him heard the words that the Reubenites and the Gadites and the Manassites spoke, it pleased them well. And they were satisfied with the explanation and they were relieved too. Verse 31 And Phinehas the son of Eleazar the priest said to the Reubenites and the Gadites and the Manassites, Today we know that the Lord is in the midst of us. In other words, God is still on our side because you haven't sinned. He is in the midst of us because you have not committed this treachery against the Lord. Now you have saved the people of Israel from the hand of the Lord. You've been loyal. You haven't sinned. And your dedication to the Lord has saved all Israel from a lot of trouble. 32. Then Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, and the chiefs returned from the Reubenites and the Gadites in the land of Gilead to the land of Canaan to the people of Israel and brought back word to them. They returned, gave a complete report to the people back home, and everybody's happy. I mean, everybody's glad that the accusations were false. They shouldn't have jumped the gun, and yet they gl they're glad that the, that the accusations were false and, and, and they weren't really going to sin, or they were not sinning. So everybody was relieved. In verse 33 it says, And the report pleased the people of Israel, and the people of Israel blessed God, and spoke no more of making war against them to destroy the land where the Reubenites and the Gadites were settled. The Reubenites and the Gadites called the altar witness. For said they, It is a witness between us that the Lord is God. And so they backed off. I mean, they were glad that the two tribes, the three tribes, were innocent. And they said no more of anything. They said no more. They just let it be. And that's the way it should be. There are some people who make their accusations and they love to accuse and when the facts don't back them up they don't give up they, they try harder to find fault and they dig and they twist and they claw and they persevere until they convince themselves that they are right even though the facts don't back them up that certainly was the case with the religious rulers and and Jesus they tried so hard to find fault with him and they couldn't but they didn't quit until they finally just made something up but what I see here is people who accused others discovered they were wrong so they happily walked away from it and they just let it be chapter 23 verse 1 a long time afterward when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all of their enemies round about, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years. <clears throat> the enemies round about refers to outward enemies. It has been 15 years since Israel had defeated her enemies. It has been 7 years since Israel distributed the land among the 12 tribes. So they're pretty much settled in. In verse 2 it says, Joshua summoned all Israel, their elders and heads, their judges and officers, and said to them, I am now old and well advanced in years. Joshua had some important words for the people, and they could not be put off any longer because he was old and he was advanced in age. 3. And you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake for it is the Lord your God who has fought for you if anyone could have talked about his accomplishments it would have been either Moses or Joshua 
the wonderful things that happened during their administrations have never been matched except Jesus but other than that and you know what Joshua he doesn't talk about what he did he talks about what God did Joshua was a humble man and he was a godly man and he was humble because he was godly that's why when you think of Joshua you think great man verse 4 behold I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes those nations that remain along with all the nations that I have already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west there were nations that remained they drove out the wicked nations as a whole but there were still pockets of heathen in the holy land and they have to be removed because they are a spiritual threat to Israel as long as they are there they'll infiltrate they will they will have uh, an influence in some way an ungodly influence on the Israelites if they're not removed in verse 5 it says the Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight and you shall possess their land as the Lord your God promised you and so God will will do the work only God can remove these heathen loiterers and only God can remove sinful habits from a Christian and just as it was important to let God remove the remaining heathen from the land it is important to let God remove all spiritual parasites from our soul if we do not they will draw the spiritual life right out of us we'll pick up our